welcome to G2G Livestream with lead pastors Harold and Atoya Alloway, who are helping us to live a progressional lifestyle with no limits. We at G2G Ministries receive the word, believe the word, and manifest the word. Join us as we listen to this life-changing word that will soon impact your life. Like and share this message and get ready for God's elevation to upgrade your life as the service is now in progress. Hey, hey, what's up, y'all? This is Pastor Hope All is Well today. Man, y'all are in for a treat. I got my brother from another mother, Pastor Warren McKnight from Philadelphia area, baby. Love Kingdom Fellowship. Listen to me. I want you to buckle your seatbelt, get prepared. God has a word for you. I want you to stand on your feet. Come on, come on, stand on your feet all over the building. Let's celebrate the gift of God and my brother, Pastor Warren McKnight. That's the man. See you in the future. Peace. Good morning, glory to God ministries. God bless you. We are so, so humbled and elated to be with you this morning. You ought to thank God right now for the blessing of technology that we can be together even though we're technically not together. We are so grateful to the Lord today to be with you. My name is Pastor Warren C. McKnight Sr. I have the pleasure along with my beautiful wife, Pastor Cynthia McKnight, of pastoring the Love King of Fellowship Church in New Jersey. We are in Logan Township, New Jersey. Philadelphia, but New Jersey, and we're grateful to be with you today. We are so grateful to God for your pastors, the man of God, hallelujah, Apostle Harold Alloway, and his beautiful wife, Latoya Alloway. Come on, I need you to stop right now and give the Lord some praise for your pastors. Come on, give the Lord some praise for your pastors. My pastor often says, it's an awful, pitiful dog who won't wag his own tail. Give the Lord some praise for your pastors. We are so excited today to be with you. We're thanking God for the season that he has your ministry in. And I pray that today as the Lord releases what he has given to me to give to you, I pray that as he releases what it is he wants to share with his people today, that you sense the presence of God on what it is God wants to share with you. I'm excited today because of what your pastor has shared with me about where God has this body of Christ. Man, I love words, so we're going to have some definitions, we're going to have some scriptures that will pop up on the screen, and I want you to get involved, be engaged. I want you to make sure you take good notes. I need for you to understand God has spoken a word specifically for your house. It's specifically for your house. And I pray in Jesus' name that you receive. So before we do anything, we want to pray and ask the presence of God. I know he's already here, but what we want to do is ask God to have his way. Are you ready? Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll get into the word today. Father, we thank you, and we give you great praise, glory, and honor. We thank you, God, for you alone are worthy. We thank you, God, that you have allowed us to be together today for the purposes of receiving your word. Now we ask God that you allow me to decrease and you increase. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you have your way. Move up and down every row. Move on the altars of our hearts. And as we yield ourselves to you today, oh God, have your way in us. We thank you and we give you great praise. In Jesus' name, and every saint with a glad heart looked heaven's way and said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. Glory to God. We are so grateful to God. I, I did not share with you the name of our ministry, the Love King of Fellowship Church. Hallelujah. We are so excited to get to this word. I just really, really want to make sure that we get all of the protocol out of the way. Um, your, your pastor, my brother, uh, Apostle Harold Alloway, is my covenant brother. Your pastor, Pastor Toya Alloway, is our covenant sister, and we thank God for them, our spiritual parents, in the persons of Pastor Tony and Cynthia Brazelton. Come on, give the Lord some praise for them. We thank God for them and the Victor, Victorious Men, Victory International Ministries in Maryland. We thank God for them. That is how we actually got together. Aren't you grateful that God doesn't make mistakes when he connects people, when he connects anointings? When he connects people that are have that have like spirits, 
We are so grateful to God to be connected to your pastors, and especially where you are in this season. When your pastor shared with me that, that Glory to God Ministries is in a season of, catch this, progressive winning. I love that. Progressive winning. Glory to God. Progressive Will somebody say that with me? Progressive winning. Glory to God. Go ahead and put that definition up there. I love the way that this, when he shared that, these words automatically came into my spirit, and I want to share them with you. Here's what progressive means. Progressive means continuous. Progressive means ongoing. Progressive means accelerating. Glory to God. Winning means victory. Winning means success. Winning means prevailing. Winning means triumph. Oh my God, glory to God ministries. You should be excited right now. You should be giving God glory right now because what that simply means is that your man of God of the apostolic anointing that is on his life has declared over your ministry and over your families that this will be your year of progressive winning. Somebody ought to give God praise right there. What that simply means is, is that you're going to have continuous ongoing accelerating winning you're going to have continuous ongoing accelerating victory continuous ongoing accelerating prevailing triumph somebody ought to give god praise in the house thank god for progressive winning Oh my God, Pastor, when the Lord, when the Lord allows you to share that word with me, there was a scripture that jumped right off the page for me as I was reading. And I want to go there. This is not where we're going to teach from, but this text is so, so powerful. So why don't you run there with me? We're in the book of Ezekiel. Y'all ready? I pray you have your running shoes on because this wholeheartedly encapsulates the theme for your ministry. Here's what the Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 47 and verse number 12. We're going to read in the easy to read version. Y'all ready? Here's what the Bible says. All kinds of fruit trees oh my God, will grow on both sides of the river. Their leaves never will become dry and fall. I feel the Holy Ghost. The fruit will never stop growing on those trees. The trees will produce fruit every month. Somebody say every month. Because the water for the trees comes from the temple. Oh my God. The fruit from the trees will be for food and their leaves will be for healing. Uh, for those of you, for, for the 20 or 30 of you that are ready to receive this, I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying that everybody that is connected to your man of God, your woman of God, everybody that, that is connected to glory to God ministry is going to experience Ezekiel 47 and 12. That means that you're going to have some fruit for your God. And here it is. Write this down if you're taking notes. How you sow in this season will be how you reap in this season. How you sow in this season will be how you reap in this season. And if you can sow right here, you're going to see the fruit in your life. Because the Bible tells us that your fruit will never stop growing. Somebody's going to shout it glory to God right there. Your fruit will never stop growing. The Bible says that your trees will produce fruit. Every month. Somebody say every month. That sounds like progressive winning to me. Every month. But here's the part that I shouted on, Pastor Harold. Here's the part that I shouted on. It's because the water for the trees comes from the temple. The water, come on, the water comes from the temple. Okay, you ain't running around yet. You ain't shouting yet. You must not understand what this text is saying to you and your family. What it's saying is that if I can stay connected, if I can stay connected to my man of God, if I can stay connected to my woman of God, if I can stay connected to the ministry that God has me planted in, the water that I get is going to supply my drink. Huh, you, did you catch that? What God is saying is, is that as you receive from the house of God, as you receive from your man of God, what's going to happen is you're going to have fruit in your life. Somebody say, God, I thank you for the fruit. I thank you for the fruit. 
Yeah, he says, he says, the Lord spoke very clearly. He said, keep on listening, people of God, and you're going to keep on learning. Are you listening? God told me to tell you to keep on listening, and you can keep on learning. Keep on listening. Oh, my God. I hear you, Holy Spirit. He says, keep on listening so you can keep on learning. I need you to understand something, that when you are in a season of progressive winning, when it's on your life, it's because you are connected to the right things. The Bible tells you and I that apart from the vine, the branches can do nothing. So I need you to understand, in this season, all we do is win. All we do is win. First John chapter 4 and verse number 17. At the end of that verse it says, because as he is, so are we in this world. I pray you receive that this morning because that's the declaration that your man of God has been speaking over the house. He's been speaking that over your life, over your family, over your future. That this is a season for progressive winning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man, I love this, and I love the theme and how he's themed everything out. The Holy Spirit has moved him to do this because I'm a huge Michael Jordan fan as well. I love basketball, and I love the analogy and the parallel that we've had in the teaching so far. And I want to start this uh, teaching off with a quote from the great Kobe Bryant, the late great Kobe Bean Bryant, who basically was the closest thing to MJ. He was the closest thing to the GOAT. The GOAT. GOAT. Greatest of all time. Uh, let me parenthetically just pause here for a moment, and, 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 and I just need to make sure that we're all on the same page. Michael Jordan was the greatest player that ever lived. Somebody say amen to that. Now, now, here it is. Here it is. I need you to hear me real quick. I'm going to come close. Here it is. If you are not in agreement that Michael Jordan is not the greatest basketball player of all time, just put up your back this finger, and you can go ahead and tip out now. Go ahead. I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting. Here's what Kobe Bryant said. Kobe Bryant said something that was so powerful, and it's going to go right into what the Lord has for us to share with you today. Here's what he said. Kobe Bryant said, I'll do whatever it takes to win. Whether it's sitting on the bench, waving a towel, handing a cup of water to a teammate, or hitting the game-winning shot. Did you hear that? What, 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 what he was saying was, what he was saying was, uh, he, says, he says, I understand that it's going to take a whole lot more for me to win. I can't do this by myself. He understands that anything of any great significance has, it has been won by a team and the coach. Are you listening? He says, he says I, I need a team, and I need to be willing to do whatever it takes for my team to win. Because if my team wins, I win. Holy God. And, and I need for you to understand that, 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 that we are getting our direction from our coach. Your coach is, is none other than the Apostle Harold Alloway and, and, and Prophet, uh, Prophetess Atoya Alloway. But those are your coaches. But I need you to hear me this, this morning. Your coaches have a coach. Your, your, your coaches have a coach. So you are getting direction from your coach who has a coach. Oh, God. Now, here's what Michael Jordan said, and this is going to help you and I, and it's going to lead us right into our discussion for this morning. Michael Jordan said something that was so powerful, and I need for you to receive this. Guess what he said? Here's the quote from Michael Jordan. He said, he said, my best ability is coach ability. He said, I'm coachable. He says, he says, he says, I'm coachable. Michael Jordan said, he said, I'm a sponge when it comes to knowledge. I, I'm ever learning. I always want to learn. I want to learn something new. I want to grasp something new. So I talk less and I listen more. Look, can I tell you this morning that when you're talking, you can't learn. When you're talking, you can't learn. All you're doing is regurgitating what you already know. That's why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Somebody say amen to that. But here's what I need for you to catch and how it parallels to us in the kingdom. Because a disciple is a disciplined learner. That's how we can learn from other things outside of the text. We can learn things from the world around us. And we can learn from Mr. Michael Jeffrey Jordan that who said he was coachable. 
Can I tell you this morning? And, and when we learn like that, we can keep on. Listen, I need you to catch this because you will live, write this down, you will live at the level you learn. You will live at the level you learn. If you learn little, you'll live low. When you learn much, you can live. Come on, somebody. God is letting you know this morning that when you live, when you learn right, you can live right. Hallelujah. I love this because, because the struggle, people that are uncoachable, they struggle with pride, posture, and positivity. That leads us right into our discussion for today. And the Lord gave me this word, and I pray that you receive today. The Lord gave me the word, the tragedy of being uncoachable. The tragedy of being uncoachable. Father, bless this word. Father, open our hearts and our minds right now to receive from your word. We thank you and give you glory right now because you and you alone are worthy of all the praise. Move like you want to in Jesus' name. And the people of God said, and the people of God said, amen. The tragedy of being uncoachable. Let's understand something right off the bat that we need to understand. Uh, when, when, when we talk about being uncoachable, at the root of being uncoachable is this insidious, subtle sin of pride. Pride is at the root of being uncoachable. And I need you to understand something because when you are prideful, pride has a posture. Uh, pride has a posture that causes you to be haughty and causes you to look down at people and causes you to be all of these things that we're going to talk about today. Pride has a posture. Pride has a posture. And generally, you won't find winners that are prideful. You won't find winners that are prideful. And we need to understand that, that if we are really going to be everything that God called us to be and operate in this progressive winning, you can't do it being prideful. Because prideful, all, being prideful also prevents us from being positive. Prideful people always live and surround themselves in a negative atmosphere. What's the most dangerous thing? The most dangerous thing about being prideful, the most dangerous thing about being uncoachable, if pride is at the root of it, is we're operating like the enemy. You operate like the devil when you're prideful. You do know that's why the enemy was booted out of heaven. He was kicked out of heaven because of pride. He didn't, he, didn't, he didn't want to be where God was. He wanted to take God's place. And God said, no, I'm not sharing my space with anybody that wants to take my place so he can't Satan out of heaven. And you need to understand when you're operating, when you're operating in pride, you're operating like the enemy. The Bible tells us that God despises pride. God hates pride. He can't stand it. So if God can't stand pride, why would that be something that you and I operate in? I need you to understand something that God hates it so much that he tells us in his word that pride comes before destruction. Pride comes before a fall. Pride brings a man low. Pride precedes shame. All of these things happen when we're prideful. And I need you to understand that the Bible continues to talk about pride and letting you and I know that it even puts us in a worse predicament. Are you ready? Let's run to James chapter 4 and verse number 6. James chapter 4 and verse number 6. We're going to read it in the New King James Version. Here's what the Bible says. But he gives more grace. Hallelujah. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Uh, do you see that? God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If we're expecting to experience a season of progressive winning, it has to be at the, at the cost of pride. We have to crucify pride in our lives. Because if we don't, the text tells us, God resists us. Can I tell you this morning that what this word resist means? When God says he resists the proud, here's what the word resist means. Resist means, look at this, it means to set oneself against in battle attire. Do you see that? It means to set oneself against 
in battle attire. In other words, when I'm prideful, God puts on his war clothes and sets himself in opposition to me. Are you listening? I don't know about you, but my arms are too short to box with God. Your arms are too short to box with God. We can't fight with God, and that's the position we place ourselves in when we're prideful. But he does the exact opposite with the humble. Oh, my God. If the humble, the Bible says he gives us grace. In fact, the text says he gives us more grace. He gives us God's riches at Christ's expense. That's what grace is. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. And he says, I give you more of that when you're humble. I give you what you don't deserve when you're humble. I give you what you shouldn't have when you're humble. Because God resists the proud while at the same time gives grace to the humble that resists. It means that he, he pushes us away. Y'all know what the Heisman, what the Heisman trophy looks like? The Heisman trophy is like you, you know, you you give them the hand, you give them a stiff. That's what God does to the proud. He gives them that stiff arm. And he says, You can't be close to me. Oh my God. He says, You can't be close to me when you're prideful. So what we have to do, if we're going to experience a season of progressive winning, we have to crucify pride. Somebody say it with me. Crucify pride. In the name of Jesus, God is calling you and I to be more like Christ. I can win when I'm like him. God, glory to God. I can win when I'm like him. Glory to God. There are three things that I want to deal with, and we're running out of here. I promise you, you know how preachers lie and say they won't be before you long? I promise you today, I won't be before you long. There's three things that we need to deal with if we're really going to crucify this uncoachable spirit. I need for you to really take an introspective look in your life today. Because you might be the one that is uncoachable, and we're going to look at a few things, and it might be you. So if it's you, didn't listen, hallelujah, the Spirit of God is present. There's just some things in this house today. But here it is. There are three things we want to talk about that we're going to look at, three characteristics of the uncoachable. Three characteristics. You might be uncoachable if one of these characteristics apply to you, if one or more of these characteristics apply to you. The first thing that we need to look at, watch this now, watch this now, you might be uncoachable if you have a problem with correction. Somebody write that down. Correction, correction, correction. Here's what the Bible says. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 1. Y'all ready? Proverbs chapter 12 and verse number 1. We're going to read it in the easy to read version. Here's what the Bible says. Whoever loves discipline loves to learn. Whoever hates to be corrected is stupid. I'm going to read it one more time so you won't think that I made this up. Or that I'm saying this, the Bible says it, uh, King Solomon said it, the wisest man other than Jesus said it, here's what he says, whoever loves discipline loves to learn, or loves correction, they love to learn, whoever hates to be corrected is stupid. Okay, now let, let, let's just let's just all right let, let, let's just jump right into this uh, because Solomon does not pull any punches. He's not worrying about being politically correct. He's not worrying about uh, 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 looking out for people's feelings. He's not worried about your emotions. He's saying what it is straight from the hip. Come on, somebody, straight from the muscle. He said, "Whoever hates correction is stupid." In other words, you're foolish because correction, watch this now, correction is for the purposes of making us better. Correction is for the purposes of making us more apt. Correction is for the purposes of making us better able. And when I understand that correction is not here to harm me, but to help me, I'll look at it a little different. Correction is not there to make you feel bad or make you feel low. No, correction is there to get you on the right path. Correction is there. You remember the shepherd. The Bible says in, in the book of Psalms, chapter 23, the Bible says the Lord is my shepherd. And you, if you know anything about shepherds, they used to carry a staff. David said his rod and his staff, they comfort me. But the staff had a hooked end on it, but it had a pointed end at the bottom. The hooked end was for the sheep. The pointed end was for the, for the enemy. Are you listening? That hooked in was for the sheep. The pointed end was for the intruders and the enemies and the wolves that would come against the sheep. 
And that hook in, what it was designed for, was to hook on to the sheep and pull them back onto the right path. That hook was supposed to pull you back in. Has anybody ever sensed the hook of God pulling you back in? You know that you were off the path. You know that you were wrong. You know that you were out of pocket. And thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for our shepherd who hooked us and brought us on back in. Is there anybody that will give God a praise this morning and say, God, I thank you for pulling me back in? That's what correction does. Correction gets us back on the right path. Correction sets us up for repentance. Correction sets you and I up for repentance. Repentance is not me saying I'm sorry. Repentance is me having a sorrowful disposition about the sin I committed. And what it means is to turn from. Oh my God. Oh, it means to turn from and turn to. God says when I correct you, it's for the purposes of you repenting, for you turning from what you were to what you could be. That's correction. That's correction. Come on. We quickly learn when someone is corrected who they really are. Uh-huh. When, 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 when you are corrected, when you are corrected, you categorize yourself as a son or a daughter or somebody else. Are you listening to me? Uh-huh. When, when, when you're corrected, how you handle correction will prove who you really are. Uh-huh. Your pastors correct you because they love you. Uh -huh. if, if they don't love you, they won't correct you. If they don't love you, they won't correct you. What did he say? If they don't love you, they won't correct you. And we need to understand that if we're going to be real, correction don't always feel good. Come on, let's be honest. Correction does not always feel good, uh, especially initially. There's a sting that comes with correction. You know you're being corrected right when there's a little sting at the beginning. Anybody ever been corrected? You've been corrected and you felt that sting. You felt it. Uh, you felt it. And, and, and here it is. It hurt at the beginning, but it helped at the end. Oh, glory to God. It hurt at the beginning, but it helped at the end. Man, I'm so grateful to God that God is like medicine. Anybody ever take, I'm an I'm a 80s, 70s kind of baby, right? Uh, I grew up in the 70s, so we had medicine like black strapping. Uh, what was the, some other medicines that were real nasty medicines? Y'all, you would have to take the nasty medicine, and, and when you took the medicine, it was nasty when you took it, but then after a little while, <laughs> that sickness was worse than the medicine, hallelujah, and when, you, when the medicine began to work, you were better on the other side. That's what correction is set up for. That's the purpose of correction. It might hurt on this side, but it's supposed to help on this side. Somebody say amen if you're with me. Say amen if you're with me. Here it is, Job chapter 5 and verse number 17. It reads this way. Look at it. Look at it. It says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. Chastening is God's way of lovingly correcting us. Because when God corrects us, please listen, when God corrects us, what he's saying is, you are my child. God only corrects his children. Somebody should be giving God praise right there. Thank you, Lord, for chasing me, because what that proves is that you love me. Can we go to the Bible and prove that? Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, in the New King James Version. Y'all ready? Let's run. Here it is, verse number 5 and 6. And you have forgotten the exhortation. And you have forgotten the exhortation, which speaks to you as to, huh? I can't hear you. That speaks to you as to sons and daughters. Glory to God. My son and daughter, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Verse 6, here it is. Here's the shout. For whom the Lord loves, glory to God, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. How you handle correction in this season is going to determine where you go in your life. Stop getting angry with God. 
Stop wondering if, if, if God is picking on you or he chose you to, he picked you out today. No, God doesn't pick you out to pick on you. He picks you out to pick you up. Oh, yeah, God. He says, no, I'm going to correct you so you can be better. I'm going to correct you so you can be better. Your pastors correct you because they love you. But if you are uncomfortable, you'll always have a problem with correction because you think you're always right. Uh -huh. you, you can't handle correction because you think you're always right. But here it is. Write this down. I'm praying that you're taking good notes because here it is. Correction does not mean condemnation. Write that down. Correction does not mean condemnation. Correction does not mean condemnation. The chastening of the Lord is to change you, not to condemn you. The chastening of the Lord is to change you, not to condemn you. Is there anybody to say, Lord, change me? Lord, change me. So that's the first characteristic. First characteristic, you might be uncoachable if you have a problem with correction. Second, second. Here it is. Number two. Number two. Second characteristic. Second characteristic that might be, you might be uncoachable if you have a problem with criticism. Write that down. Criticism. Here it is. Proverbs chapter 9. Verses 7 through 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verses 7 through 9. In the easy to read version, the Bible says, Criticize a person who is rude and shows no respect, and you will only get insults. Correct the wicked, and you will only get hurt. Verse 8. Don't correct such people, or they will hate you. But correct those who are wise. Hallelujah. And they will love you. Verse 9, teach the wise and they will become wiser. Instruct those who live right and they will gain more knowledge. Oh my God. Are you running around the church yet? Because I can't see you. Are you running yet? Oh, thank God. Thank God for criticism. I need you to look at these things differently a little bit today. Look at what at the root of criticism is the word critique. At the root of the word criticism is the word critique. Here's what the word critique means. Critique means, look at this, it means detailed, a detailed analysis and assessment of something. An evaluation or commentary. Okay, okay. So now, with the understanding of that word in mind, here's the question that I want to pose. Why do we get so bent out of shape when somebody criticizes us? Well, why, why do we get all in our feelings when somebody criticizes us? Well, well, why do we have to, we got, we got to clap back, we ready to rumble when somebody criticizes us? Oh, come on, let's just be honest and shame the devil. Somebody criticized you and you was ready to punch him in the face. Come on, who am I talking to? We're going to have an altar call at the end. Come on, if that's you, say, yeah, Pastor, that's me. That's me, because I don't understand criticism, and you need to understand criticism. All it is is a critique. It's commentary from somebody else. But here's what I need for you to catch. Here's what I need for you to catch, because I get it. Some people don't have a filter. Some people just say anything that comes out of their mouth. Anything that pops into their mind, it comes out of their mouth. No, they don't have any type of, any type of, uh, uh, any type of a, uh, I don't know what word I'm trying to say. <laughs> they don't have any type of, 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 uh, of, 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 of proper etiquette. They have no etiquette. So what they do is they can say whatever comes out of their mouth. You know how your kids used to be? I know my kids used to run into our room early in the morning, and our kids could be so brutally honest. And my children would grab me by my face, and they would say, good morning, daddy. And I would say, good morning, beautiful. Or good morning, son. I love you so much. And nine times out of ten, they would say, daddy, your breath. Come on, somebody. And it hurt my feelings, but all it was was a critique. Come on, somebody. It was their commentary on what they'd experienced. Here's what I need for you to catch, because it's vitally important, vitally important. Criticism can help us if we stop being so soft. Criticism could help you if you stop being so thin-skinned. Criticism could help us if we stop being so sensitive and overly emotional, especially in the church. You can't say nothing to anybody. But I need you to understand that, that, that we can learn from criticism. Hallelujah. Listen, I believe the goat is going to help us 
Whenever I say to go, you know what I'm talking about, MJ, Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan's going to help us. He gave us another principle here. I need you to catch this. Listen to me. Uh, because something happened to him in the 19, at the end of the 1986-87 season. At the end of this, reporters don't know whether it was a reporter or whether it was a coach. But somebody criticized Michael. They criticized him. They said, Mike, okay, you had a great season. You know, you score the ball well. Uh, you do this and do that. You kind of facilitate a little bit. You're not that selfish. But, but the thing that we don't, the thing that you don't do well is you don't play good defense. They told Michael Jordan that he didn't play good defense. They said, you take some plays off. And, you know, you kind of low sometimes on the defensive end. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so, so at that point, after he received that criticism, Mike could have done one of two things. He could have, like what most of us do, clap back. Come on, somebody. Somebody criticizes you, you come right back to it. Are oh, you coming for me? I'm coming for you. Come on. My Mike said, my, Mike could have, Mike could have rebutted and refuted the remarks. He could have said, no, that's not true. He could have said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm MJ. He could have taken, he could have been prideful because he was Michael Jordan. Come on, somebody. He could have done that. Or he could have done what he did. He used the criticism as fuel. He used the criticism as motivation. Come on, somebody. He used the criticism as a motivation. And I need you to understand something. What he did that summer was different than any other summer that Michael Jordan had ever existed. What he did that summer was he focused on his weaknesses. Because it truth be told, when somebody criticizes you, there could be some sense of truth in it. Do you get so offended that you can't see the truth in a criticism? It might mean you're uncomfortable. Mike went home. Mike went to the gym every day. He worked on his regular stuff. But this particular summer, what he did was he worked on his defense. He worked on the thing that he was criticized in because he took a look an honest inventory of himself. And he said, you know what? Maybe I do low sometimes. Maybe I don't play D like I should. And what I need to do is work on it. I help me in here. I pray you're receiving this. Michael Jordan went home. He worked on his craft. He worked on his defensive skills. And, and, and when the season came around, Michael Jordan had a new tenacity. He had a new look in his eye. And at the end of the 87-88 season, most critics of the NBA say it was the most impactful, powerful season that one NBA player ever had, and it was on the heels of a criticism. Go ahead, God, put that graphic up. Look at everything that Michael Jordan accomplished in this one year, 87 to 88. Look at this. He was the league MVP. He was the steals leader. He was the scoring champion. He was the all-star game MVP. He was the dunk contest champion. And the cherry on top, the part that he was criticized in, he was the defensive player of the year. Are y'all hearing me? Are you here? Listen, he turned criticism into a catalyst to change. Oh, my God. I pray you receive that. Somebody write that down. Receive criticism as a catalyst to change. It ought to help you and how to look at yourself. And somebody telling you something about you, you ought not to just dismiss it. Look at yourself. Take an honest inventory of the criticism. God, maybe I don't do that, and I need help here. I need to work on this. I need to work on that. Is there anybody that says, I need to adjust some things? Somebody look at somebody else and tell them, adjustment, adjustment. Because that's what criticism ought to cause us to do. It ought to cause you and I to adjust things. Hallelujah. Because here it is. When I adopt this mindset, I never lose. <laughs> I never lose. I always win or I learn. But I never lose. Glory to God. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord. So that means even when I go through what may be deemed to be a failure, I still win. Even when I go through what deems to be something down, I still win because I have the spirit of a winner because I can accept criticism. Are you listening? You might be uncoachable if you got a problem with correction, if you have a problem with criticism, and the last thing, if you have a problem being checked. If you have a problem being checked. 
Here's what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. We're about to run out of here. Here's what the Bible says. Some people like to do things their own way, and they get upset when people give them advice. <laughs> Fools don't want to learn from others. They only want to tell their own ideas. People of God, you might be uncoachable if nobody else's ideas matter. You might be uncoachable if, if somebody offers you a suggestion and you immediately shoot it down. But here on the flip side, here's what uncoachable people do. They always want somebody else to co-sign their ideas. But they never co-sign anybody's ideas. They always want somebody else to co-sign their suggestions. But they don't co-sign anybody else's suggestions. You might be uncoachable if you got a problem being checked. If you got a problem not changing, your way might not always be the best way. Talk back to me, somebody. If you got a problem being corrected, if you got a problem being criticized, and if you got a problem being checked, you might be uncoachable. The best players that I knew, the players that I played with in Philly, the best players that I knew, most of them did not play Division I basketball nor play any professional basketball overseas or in the NBA. And the reason they didn't is because they were labeled uncoachable. The reason it's such a tragedy is because they, had, they were so gifted. The reason it was such a tragedy is because they had so much to offer. But because they were uncoachable, they were never able to offer it. The world was never able to see it. And I want to encourage you this morning, don't be labeled uncoachable. You have great coaches in the house, and you need to make sure you are coachable. That's my simple message this morning, is that we are coachable. And I encourage you today, last thing that we're running out of here, I need you to understand if you're going to be coachable, you need to become fat. If you're going to be coachable, you need to become fat. I love fat partners. I love fat leaders. I love fat I love fat friends. I love fat family. Fat. F-A-T. If you are going to operate an experienced and progressive women, you need to become fat. Are you ready? Here it is. Fat means faithful, available, and teachable. If you're going to operate an experience in, in this progressive women's season, you need to be fat. You need to be faithful, meaning you can be counted on. I don't know about anybody else, but I need a squad around me. I need people that are going to be faithful, people that can be counted on. When all the chips are down, when everybody runs away, I need some people that will be faithful. But you can be faithful, watch this, and not available. Available means I'm going to ride with you. Available means I'm going to rock with you. Me and your pastor, Harold Alloway, we're going to rock together till the wheels fall off. Me and your pastor, Atoya Alloway, and my wife, Pastor Cynthia, we're going to rock until the wheels fall off. Why? Because we are available. You need to make yourself available in this season because God wants to do something in your life. Faithful. Available. Last thing, God says, stay teachable. Staying teachable is really just another word for staying coachable. I'm going to listen so I can learn. I'm going to keep listening so I can keep learning. I'm going to keep listening so I can keep learning. And as I learn, I can live better. Because I will live at the level that I learn. And I know you're getting some great teaching at Glory to God Ministries. I know the Lord is releasing nugget after nugget, principle after principle. And you need to make sure you are in the house so you can receive the living bread of God. Because the more I listen, the more I learn. And the better I learn, the better I can live. Will somebody give the Lord a praise in the house? Will somebody give God, I need you to stand on your feet all over the building, from the front to the back. I need you to give God a praise and make this declaration, I refuse to be uncoachable. Come on, say it again. I refuse to be uncoachable. Ha, hallelujah. All I will say, I refuse to be uncoachable. In the name of Jesus, I speak a coachable spirit over this house right now. I want to pray very quickly as we close. 
I just want you to know that God, God is serious about this season of progressive winning. He is serious about what has been spoken and declared over your life. And all you have to do is receive it. Hallelujah. Can I pray with you? Can I pray with you? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray over your house. I pray over your ministry. Glory to God ministries. I pray over the ministry and I pray over your pastors. Apostle Harold Alloway and Prophetess Atoya Alloway. I pray over them, oh God, that you continue to crown their heads with wisdom. And Father, you continue to breathe on them the inerrant word of God that they will be able to stand up under the power of the Holy Ghost and continue to share with your people about this season of progressive winning. Thank you, God, that we win and we never lose. Thank you for this moment. We do not take it for granted. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Every saint with a glad heart looked up its way and said, Amen, Amen, and bless God. We love you so much. We thank God for your attention. I'm out of time, but I thank God for yours. We'll continue to pray for you. Please continue to pray for us. Pastor Cynthia McKnight, Pastor Warren McKnight, love you so much. Listen, until next time, continue to be blessed and continue to be coachable. Hey, G2G partners and friends. Thank you so much for tuning in to our live stream service. Did you enjoy your time with us today? We pray you received an on-time word that will forever change your life. Our lead pastors, Harold and Atoya Alloway, make it a priority to teach and preach the gospel of kingdom to all people, including you. If this word has impacted you today, feel free to sow a love seed. We believe that giving is an act of worship and is one way to show gratitude to God. Your generosity is appreciated. Stay connected with us as we continue to reach millions worldwide. Go ahead, follow us on social media and hit that notifications button to get alerted when we go live. Again, thank you for taking the time out to join our online service. We can't wait to see you next week. Stay tapped in. God is doing something new.